morning once again, and uh, welcome to today's session on uh, APIs and microservices. So, like Asma said, my, my name is Nuan Dias. I work as a director of API architecture in WSO2. So, just a little bit about me. Uh, I work. Uh, I joined WSO2 back in 2011. So that's uh, close to seven years now. I was initially in the ESB team, uh, working as a, a software engineer. And about one and a half years later, I joined the API manager team and have been there since. So I'm mainly responsible for, for the roadmap, for the vision, the direction, and of course, uh, all the engineering that happens around uh, the API manager. I spend most of my time with the engineering team. So yeah, that's about me. And today I'll be talking about basically uh, APIs and their importance in a microservice architecture, which of course uh, is a very interesting topic uh, in today's world. Um, so to begin with, I'd like to uh, start up by uh, talking why we need microservices uh, in the first place. To explain that, I'll be using uh, 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 an example of a monolith application and see what problems we have in them. Right, so if you look at a typical monolith application, so this is like a, a picture of a typical monolith application of a retail website. So if you look at a traditional um, monolith application of a retail website, you'll probably have functions performing operations on your product to browse your product catalog, functions performing operations uh, to make orders, to cancel orders and likewise, functions for updating your inventory, uh, likewise. So, so in a typical monolith application, all of these will be bundled into a single execution runtime. Right, so that's what a typical uh, monolith app will look like. Um, so if you want to scale this type, of, uh, this type of an application, what you would do is you will have more than one instance of this type of an, of an application and put them all behind a load balancer. Right, and then you basically load balance behind those. So, uh, I have worked with these types of applications and I'm pretty sure that most of you have worked with these types of apps as well. They've been serving our business as well, they've been making us money. So, what is wrong and why are we trying to fix this now? Why are we calling these as monolith applications and treating them like, like the bad guys now? Right, so, so if you were listening to Sanjeeva's talk yesterday, so he was talking about how risky it is of not being able to innovate fast, right? He was emphasizing on the fact that uh, not being able to in innovate fast is a, a fatal risk, right? He was talking about how businesses can vanish uh, like that if you, if you're not able to innovate fast. So the problem with these types of applications is just that. Now, if you think of making a change to a simple function, like if you have a bug or something in your shipping function, and you want to fix that, you basically go and fix that piece of code, but you compile your entire application and redeploy in, in your production system, right? But that's a lot of risk, and that's a lot of work involved. Because although you don't technically change any of the, uh, the rest of the functions, you're basically compiling your entire application and redeploying it. So that involves lots of regression testing and lots of things, right? So you can't do changes fast enough and confidently enough without impacting the rest of your system. So that is the problem that we are facing with these applications and that's why we are talking a lot about microservices these days. So to talk about microservices, so these are some of the characteristics that Martin Fowler sets out when you're designing a microservice application. The first one is, of course, composability. So he, he explains that you should design your application's components in such a way that they have to be modularized so that, uh, or rather componentized, so that they can be independently developed, independently tested, and independently deployed without impacting the rest of the components, right? That's a very important factor for you to uh, reach this level of agility. And also, when organizing these components, they have to be thought about from a business functionality point of view and not from a technology stack point of view. What that means is, if you look at, uh, if you compare with the earlier diagram, if you have your orders function and your products function on a Java stack, right, uh, having them both on a same Java stack doesn't mean that they should belong in a single microservice. If you have a set of functions that operate on your product stack and they have the, probably have the same level of security requirements, same level of uh, uh, scalability requirements, that makes sense to be in a single microservice, but just because your orders and products are on uh, 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 the same technology stack doesn't mean you should put them in a 
single microservice. That's the importance of thinking about the composability of these from a business functionality point of view and not from a technology point of view. And he also emphasizes the importance of the ring single responsibility principle, where he talks about the importance of a microservice doing one thing and one thing only. That's again critically important when it comes to uh, doing changes without impacting other layers of your system. Uh, and when also about smart endpoints and dump pipes. Uh, so I'm pretty sure most of you here have worked with uh, ESBs. Have you worked with ESBs? Few? Okay, good. So if you know, if you look at the, the ESB kind of architectures, right, you will realize that the services behind an ESB are somewhat dumb in the sense that the services uh, behind an ESB know what to do when given a set of parameters and know how to do that task only. For example, if, if there's a service that processing uh, orders, if someone tells it to go and place an order, it, 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 that service will know how to process that order. It won't know that it has to, in order to complete this order, that it needs to talk to a, a shipping service so that the order gets shipped to the customer. That intelligence is built into the ESP layer in most of the cases, right? So the microservices architecture advocates the reverse of that, saying that this intelligence should not be built into a single layer, but it has to be an inherent behavior intelligence in the system. What that means is, when processing an order, either the order service has to know how to talk to the shipping service and tell it to do the shipment after processing the order, or the microservice emits an event, event into the system saying, I processed an order, now the guys who are interested in this order go and do whatever you want. So the shipping service who's listening to this goes and picks up that message and says, okay, right, fine, now I have to go and uh, uh, do this shipment for this order. Likewise, right? So that's the whole idea behind uh, smart endpoints and, and dumb pipes. So if you take all of this into consideration, one thing you will realize is that uh, you're uh, going to end up with lots of services, lots of components, and lots of interactions between them. So if you don't have a, a well-defined, well-executable CI-CD pipeline, doing microservices is going to be a pretty bad idea because there's lots of management that's going to be involved when you get into this. So having a well-executable CI-CD pipeline is going to be critically important. So taking all these factors into, con into consideration, if you try to redesign that small application into a microservice application, this is probably what it, you will end up with. You'll have like a products microservice, orders microservice, and you have um, like interactions between them. For example, the orders microservice talks to the shipping when it processes an order and updates your inventory. And your client app, when it wants to browse your product catalog, it will go and talk to your product service. When it wants to place an order, it will go and talk to your order service likewise. So at first glance, you realize that there's lots of chaos in this system, lots of noise, lots of services, and lots of interactions. And so there's lots of integration involved here, right? So if you were listening to, to Tyler's keynote yesterday, you would have realized that his emphasis on the importance of integration agility. So that's why if you don't have the capability to be integration agile, handling this or dealing with this chaos becomes a problem, right? So let me talk about now why and how APIs can help you to solve some of the problems that come when you're going to do this, right? So the reason I'm emphasizing on microservices here before talking about APIs is that sometimes when we do APIs, we forget about the fundamentals of microservices. I've seen many an instance where people, uh, when they say they want to do a microservice architecture, what they really do is they get rid of an ESB layer and push all of that functionality to the API layer or an API gateway layer. That doesn't necessarily mean you're, become, you're building a microservice friendly architecture. That's like you're getting rid of an ESP and pushing all that orchestration into a, another layer, which is uh, not the point, right? So uh, one of the first things that can be done in order to get rid of this chaos or rather to bring some a sense of order into this chaos, it is to have an API gateway as the entry point into your system. So now if you uh, compare this image with the, e with the earlier image, your client application now needs to know about one endpoint to talk to, not 
five or 10 APIs to talk to, right? And even your inter-service communication can be handled via an API gateway layer. So immediately you get a sense of uh, order into the chaotic nature of the previous architecture, right? So another, uh, uh, there are several advantages in this. So we'll go through them one by one. Uh, so one of the key advantages in this is uniform exposure. So uh, going back to the previous image, now if you think of a scenario where you have independent teams developing these independent microservices, right? You'll have one team developing the products microservice and uh, orders maybe on a Java stack, the shipping size, uh, microservice maybe on a Go stack. So you have several teams in your org developing this independent. Chances are that you are going to end up with non-uniform ways of exposing these microservices, right? Because these teams uh, operate on their own autonomy, right? So you won't have uniform URL structures, you won't have uniform product stack, right? At least that's what we are dreaming of, right? So when you uh, have that kind of a, 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 an infrastructure, talking or to these microservices is going to be tough, right? Uh, fr uh, from a client point of view. They have to figure out how to talk to each of these uniform endpoints and they are, there's no uniformity. Sorry, independent endpoints without uniformity, right? So that's why exposing them through an API gateway becomes a good idea because there you can apply your, your verification policies, your governance policies, everything, and make sure they are exposed in a uniform manner. Uh, and also on the discovery of endpoints. So I mentioned this before that your client application doesn't now need to know about five different endpoints to talk to. It just needs to know about one. Uh, and organizing security boundaries. So each of these independent microservices may have different security policies, may have different authorization policies. So exposing all of that complexity to your client applications, it's not going to be a good idea, right? So you need to have some kind of layer which is capable of transferring between these security policies, these authorization policies, exchanging tokens, exchanging credentials, likewise. Uh, and also other kinds of policy enforcement, access control policies, rate limiting policies, and all of that can be enforced if you expose this layer through an API management or an API uh, gateway. Uh, and also in, in terms of analytics, business value reporting. So you may have heard a lot about microservices during this conference and in the past, and you may have seen lots of technologies for uh, monitoring microservices. Most of these uh, monitoring are around the operational aspects, like the performance, the CPU, and all of that, right? But as a business, when you're exposing these services, it's also critically important to understand the business value analytics side of things, right? So getting that out of your microservices is kind of going to be tough because they are too fine-grained, too uh, down the line, right? So having a business sense of what's going on is going to be pretty much much easier when you have it uh, on an API gateway kind of uh, layer. Uh, then when it comes to load balancing and discovery, so I talked about uh, microservices having to talk with other microservices uh, for, for fulfilling their business requirements, right? So when one microservice goes through several iterations, like you have version one of your product service, order service, version two of your order service, likewise, right? So they may have dynamic IP addresses, dynamic host names, especially if you're operating on like a, a container managed system, like in a Kubernetes environment, for example. So uh, your, your service endpoints are going to be changing rapidly. Now, how, does, how, how do you solve this problem when you want one microservice to talk to another, another microservice that doesn't have a fixed address? So that's where uh, registry services, such as etcd, console, come into the picture, right? So there you have a mechanism of where you can register uh, your services with a service name, and then you can uh, have different IPs changing. So uh, you can, of course, build the integration at your microservices layer when you want to talk to this, or, or rather, it's much easier if you do it at an API gateway. So your microservice doesn't need to worry about where the other microservice resides. It just talks to a gateway to go to that, and the gateway can integrate with the relevant registry services, figure out the endpoint properly, and route your request accordingly. So that's another uh, key advantage of having an API gateway in a microservice uh, architecture. 
Uh, it also becomes important when you are transitioning from a monolith to a microservice architecture. So when you are transitioning, uh, chances are that lots of things are going to be changing behind the scenes. So exposing this change to your client application is not going to be a feasible approach. So one of the ways to address this scenario is to first expose your entire application through a uniformly defined API gateway layer so that your client application only talks with the gateway and then you slowly start to decompose your monolith application into microservices, right? So as in this example, you first take out the product function into a separate microservice. So it may have different URLs, uh, different access patterns. That's fine because your client is not exposed to all of this complexity because they only deal with a, a gateway, right? So when it comes to uh, orchestration, so fine. Now you have, like, assume that you have transitioned all of your monolith into a microservices architecture and you have a nice clean architecture and system running. But this doesn't stop here. Your business wants to innovate more. There will be more demands coming in. Now imagine a situation where you want to, uh, a certain functionality is required such that you have to do some integration between your products microservice and your mic orders microservice. Now what do you do in this situation? Right? One option of course is to introduce a completely new microservice which does all of that. But if you go down that path, you're kind of duplicating code. You're uh, basically writing the code again to do something that the products and orders microservice does already. Or uh, you do some kind of an orchestration. Right? You do an orchestration between these two and solve this problem. Now, how do you do that orchestration? One approach, of course, is to go with the traditional ESB architecture where you have uh, a, an ESB which does the orchestration between these, uh, the, the relevant services. But ESBs are inherently not very microservice friendly due to their nature of their implementation. Probably the bulkiness, the, 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 uh, the, the configuration models and all of that, right? And it goes against the principle of uh, smart endpoints and dumb pipes again. A better approach probably is to have a layered microservice architecture where you have right at the bottom your, or right at the right, uh, you have your core atomic microservices doing all your business functionality and you have a separate set of integration microservices that performs the specific integration that you're talking about, like the integration between the product and the, uh, uh, the orders microservice, right? So this again conforms to the principles that we talk about, talked about, about smart endpoints uh, and about single responsibility and all of that. So if it's a good idea for the integration layer to be decomposed into integration microservices, doesn't the same rule apply for the API layer, right? So far we've been talking about an API layer which is, which is a single layer, which is not decomposed, which is a monolith API gateway model, right? And the answer to that question is yes. It sometimes is a very good idea to decompose your APIs into smaller units as well. And this is where micro gateways come into the picture. So the idea is that you don't have all your APIs on a single monolith API gateway, but rather you have micro gateways doing uh, micro API transactions. So you deploy your micro gateways closer to your integration microservices or clo even closer to your atomic uh, core microservices as well, right? That again gives you the flexibility of scaling. Now, if you want to have 100 instances of, of your product microservice and just two instances of your orders microservice, and now if you have them exposed on a single gateway, there's a problem of how do you scale this now? How do you scale this? Do you have 100 instances of the gateway, of the monolith gateway? Uh, but if you go for a micro gateway kind of an architecture, the, the answer is pretty straightforward because you have independent micro, micro gateways for your products microservice and independent micro gateways for your uh, orders microservice so you can scale them accordingly. Another critically important factor could be optimization. So you could have your like uh, a thousand character product catalog that serves your website uh, like uh, fr from your products microservice. Now, it's probably not a good idea to expose the same product microservice for your mobile clients because your mobile clients don't need all of that information simply because they can't render them. 
right? Now, so how do you deal with this problem, right? So if, if, it, if it's a good behaving, a good mobile app, it needs to be optimized, use only the data, it needs likewise, right? You get the point. So uh, a good idea is to optimize your product's uh, microservice or rather your microservices to the client type it is serving. So the idea here is that you could expose the same product's microservice through a mobile gateway and through a web gateway to serve the two different types of clients. So the mobile gateway will optimize the response that it will cut down that thousand lines of uh, HTML or whatever in, into the JSON structure it needs and render it to your mobile device. But your web gateway will probably proxy it through without doing anything, right? So this is another adva a key advantage of going for a, uh, a decomposed, decentralized gateway architecture, probably coupled with some integration microservices as well. So this is, uh, uh, like I said, uh, where micro gateways come into the picture. So last month, about a month back, we introduced uh, version 2.5 of our uh, WSO2 API manager. Uh, along with it came the WSO2 API micro gateway. Um, so I'll walk you through some of its uh, design characteristics to explain to you what it does and how it does. Um, so Uvindra and his team after lunch will be doing a, a detailed uh, demo session and they'll be touching upon how this works as well. So if you want to see it in action, you can go there and you can look, have a look at it. Uh, so first of all, it is designed to scale. What that means is that it does not have in the runtime any links to external components. So if you're familiar with how the standard gateway works, it needs the assistance of a key manager or a security token service to validate tokens. It needs the assistance of a traffic manager for rate limiting, it needs the assistance of an analytics engine for recording all of your information. But the micro gateway doesn't need any of those links. It can do all of this stuff by itself. I'll, I'll explain to you in brief how it does that. And it has native support for Docker and Kubernetes. So if you're like uh, operating in a container uh, orchestration system, you'll know the importance of being able to get a Docker file in a flash, right? being able to get Kubernetes artifacts in a flash without having to code 100 lines of YAML. right? Uh, and uh, another key important factor is that it can operate as a private jet for your API. What that means is it can Per, it can serve as a, a gateway per each API in your system or uh, per subset of APIs. Um, and it has first class support for environment, uh, like you can compile it once in your dev environment and use it across all of your dev, QA and staging and production environments without having to uh, touch a line of code, uh, basically program through environment variables after that point. So, uh, yeah, I'll go through this stuff real quick about how it works. So at the moment, we have the WSO2 API manager, which is where all your API interfaces, the metadata, and the documentation exists. So the micro gateway toolkit, we call it, it basically connects to the API manager, downloads the interface definition and the metadata it needs. So if you want to uh, create a gateway runtime of an API called foo, you just give it the parameter, it downloads the API called foo, and then compiles a micro gateway runtime. So I'll explain to you what this runtime is. It can be of different flavors. Um, so when it comes to uh, security, I mentioned to you that it doesn't need the assistance of other components in order to enforce security. So how that works is, when your client application is requesting for an access token uh, to access your services, it will request uh, from the API manager or from any uh, STS, a security token service, a signed self-contained uh, token. That particular token will have all of the information the gateway needs in order to apply all the security, the authentication and authorization policies. So it's a self-contained token and it is signed by the STS. So whenever the gateway receives a request with this token as in the header, what it, the only thing it has to do is to verify the signature. Verify the signature and make sure it is signed by a trusted SDS and then inspect the information in that token to apply all the authentication and authorization policies. And just to be backward compatible with our 
uh, with, with our customers using your old application, we also support the standard OAuth um, authentication flow, where if you get a, an opaque token, which is not a self-contained token, it can talk, to, talk back to the STS and then uh, do the validation. So in this case, if you want to scale the gateway, you have to think about scaling the STS as well, but not so in the previous case. And when it comes to rate limiting, uh, it's the same. The rate limiting policies, uh, if you're familiar with the older version of the gateway, uh, the rate limiting policies are in a separate component called the traffic manager. He's the guy who knows what the tier gold means, what the tier bronze means, all of that. But in this case, when you compile the micro gateway, uh, what happens is all of these rate limiting policies are compiled into the gateway itself. So when it applies rate limiting policies on your request, it doesn't need to talk anywhere outside. It can just do it by itself. Right, same case with analytics. So again, if you're familiar with the, the, the older version of the gateway, uh, what the older version does is it, uh, upon serving requests, it pushes events into an analytics engine. It keeps flushing all those events. So it needs that connection, basically. But in this version, what we do is basically accumulate all data into a local file system and uh, rotate these files on a periodic basis. So these files can be either uh, uh, flushed into the analytics uh, engine offline if the gateway has a link to the analytics engine, at least from time to time, or you flush them into a shared file system location where some other guy can process them in the sense that read them and flush them off into an analytics engine. So this way you still get the same level of analytics and knowledge uh, of what's happening in your system. Uh, right, so I talked about the runtime. So uh, what I said was like the runtime can be of different flavors. So what I meant was based on the parameters that you give into the build command, at the time of building this microservice, the output can differ. So if you just use the most basic uh, command to build, the output of the build command would be a server. You get a VM, basically a Linux process that you can, uh, a zip file that you can extract and uh, run, uh, a bash script, right? So that yeah, you get a VM, a server. But if you provide the necessary uh, parameters in order to build a Docker image, the output of the build command would be a Docker image. So once you uh, execute the build command, you'll get the Docker image out of it. And you can use it in your registries and stuff. And if you give the necessary para parameters to come up with the Kubernetes artifacts, the output of the build command would be the Kubernetes artifacts that you can then use uh, in your deployments. So like I said before, it can be compiled once in your dev environment and reused across uh, your different environments. And uh, the, the connections, your backend URLs, credentials, all of them can be programmed by uh, providing those values via environment variables. Uh, so Asanka yesterday talk, uh, talked about the cell-based architecture and he briefly mentioned about this, but I would like to uh, repeat it a little bit again about the role of a gateway in, in a cell-based architecture. So the, the uh, idea here is that a cell is a logical uh, uh, collection of uh, cohesive microservices, uh, microservice pods, for example, right? So the, the role of the gateway uh, in this case is at the entry point. So you will have an API gateway layer which acts as all the, in, in, uh, the, the entry point into your cell. All the inter-microservice communication will happen within the cell uh, through, uh, through some data plane compo components, uh, which could be micro gateways, uh, but the exposure of the functions within your cell will happen through an outer uh, API gateway layer. And if you are someone who's familiar with service meshes, who have worked with uh, Istio, Linkerd, uh, and also you may have realized that there are some overlapping functionality between uh, gateways and services meshes, the, the, the functionality that these two guys have to offer. But there's, there are subtle differences in here as well. So service meshes, uh, mainly the data plain components of the service businesses primarily talk about the inter-microservice communication. Basically the things that happen inside the cell, how one microservice pod talks to another microservice pod, likewise. 
it is actually the API gateway that deals with the edge services. Basically, what you expose to your consumers outside your applications. It's the API gateway or the API management layer that does this kind of an exposure. So that is one of the key differences between uh, uh, the service measures and an API gateway. Uh, so yeah, finally, now if you, if you look at what uh, I'd like to set some thoughts about the future. So if you look at what we have to offer uh, in the gateway so far, it's, uh, uh, it's more of, a, uh, of an orchestration architecture, kind of. So if you're familiar with the, uh, about the difference between an orchestra and a ballet, right? In an orchestra, you have like the lead, the, the, the person who's leading the orchestra, instructing the musicians about what to do, right? And they do it based on the instructions they get. But a ballet is kind of different where the, the dancers listen to the music and they tune their steps or change their steps based on the changes that are happening in the music, right? So you can think of this as an event-driven architecture where the, the system listens to events that are happening in the system and reacts based upon that. So this is kind of a, like our thinking for the future. It's not something we've done, but something that we are looking ahead into the future. So uh, the, currently the system uh, works more of like in a like you call me kind of a service, uh, a way architecture. So this is one of the things that, are, that we'll be uh, working on and building in into the gateway as we move along, basically about the ability to listen to the system and react upon the messages uh, that it receives. So uh, with that, I'd like to end my session. I'm actually out of time, so I won't be taking any questions right now, so, but I'll be here for the rest of the day. You can, if you have any questions, please uh, come and talk to me. I'll be here at lunch and in, in the evening session too. So thanks guys for listening.